Good evening. My name is Ashok Gurung. I'm the director of India China Institute. And I'm really happy. I'm really happy because weather is good. But despite weather becoming really good, that a lot of you chose to be with us this evening. Uh, that really says a lot about uh, your interest. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you will not be disappointed you know, uh, with the presentation that we have for you. Uh, so I really want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, before I introduce our main speaker and three discussants, uh, I just want to take a few minutes to thank a uh, few uh, individuals and also for a uh, you know, few uh, organizations who have made this possible. First, really, I never get to thank my uh, office uh, team. And since one of our colleagues, she's a graduate student here, Christina, Christina, she's our events coordinator. She really uh, you know, works so hard, and she has put together many great events this semester. So I want to thank Christina today, formally. And also, there are a number of other uh, graduate students who work at ICI as research assistants, research associates, Chris Cruz, Shalini Kishan. I don't know who else is around here. So there are a number of them. Some of them are still working in the office because we have a major symposium uh, this coming Monday. So thanks to uh, everyone in the office. Uh, special thanks to Rubin Foundation. Rubin Museum, as many of you probably know, is in the neighborhood. They have amazing collection of uh, art uh, uh, from that part of Himalaya. Uh, and also they do a lo lot of amazing you know, uh, public uh, events. So uh, Rubin Foundation made a special grant uh, to uh, the new school, to Lang uh, College, and to uh, India China Institute. Uh, and here, uh, you know, we got this grant mainly because of another grant that we received from another uh, uh, wonderful foundation called Loose Foundation. And I'm delighted that uh, our colleague, uh, Toby Wolfman, uh, who is from the Loose Foundation, is here. Really, thanks to Toby for making actually all of this possible, uh, because what that grant does is help us uh, bring uh, people like David Jurek uh, and Siddiq Wahid and several others, uh, other scholars who really uh, have devoted you know, a, a big chunk of their uh, life and uh, especially their scholarship uh, in, in a focused in the Himalayas. So, so I just want to thank both Luce Foundation and also Rubin Foundation for making this evening possible. Uh, and a special regret from uh, the Dean of Lang College, Stephanie Browner, who uh, was scheduled to make opening remarks, but she had to go to Cambodia for a special assignment. Uh, but again, you know, I want to thank all the colleagues from uh, Lang College who are present here for uh, really uh, making this evening possible. Now let me uh, turn to uh, the uh, main speaker, Professor David Zurich. David. Uh, David is a very good friend of mine. Uh, and uh, David really is a man of many, many, many talents. Uh, he identifies himself as someone who is trained as a geographer, a world-class photographer, uh, who really, uh, you know, uh, as he tells in his uh, biography, uh, he left home sometime in 1975 on a journey on, you know, many of you might recognize, overland trail from Europe to Asia. And since then, I think he has been traveling. And he has been traveling uh, and devoting a big chunk of his time in uh, Himalayas, both you know, to really look at issues in that part of the world from a scientific development perspective, as well as really through his lens, capturing you know, uh, many of the intangibles that you know, uh, are equally important in understanding Himalayas. Uh, he completed his PhD in geography at the University of Hawaii at East-West Center, Honolulu. And he has written extensively about Asia and the Pacific. Uh, his uh, writings and photography have won uh, numerous awards, including the National Outdoor Book Award in 2006 for Illustrated Atlas of the Himalaya, and the Mount Everest Award in 2009 for, the, for his Himalaya studies. This past summer, uh, I had a privilege of you know, uh, having him and my team to really visit a very special place called Kailash, 
which is in the uh, uh, southern, uh, uh, southwestern part of Tibet, uh, very close to the border of Nepal and India. Uh, and uh, it was at that time, you know, when you travel for about two weeks, you know, sleeping in, you know, uh, tight, you know, places, uh, traveling together and hiking, you know, through all these amazing places, you could really get to know uh, people and uh, very well. And David is really one of those people who, uh, you know, is uh, really uh, amazing, uh, uh, both as a you know student of Himalayas and as a scholar of Himalayas. So I'm really delighted that. Uh, he could join us today uh, to show some of his work. His uh, book, you know, on whose uh, on the basis of that book is what you know this lecture is all about. It's called uh, the uh, Land of Pure Vision: Sacred Geography of Tibet and the Himalaya. Uh, is going to be published this summer, right? So, if you are interested, you know, please you know uh, let us know, and we will connect you or, and how you can order that. And uh, let me now briefly introduce three discussants. They too have a very long and very accomplished in a, uh, in a uh, resume, but I'll be brief. Uh, we'll be joined by Mark Larrymore. Mark is a colleague uh, and another really uh, key collaborator uh, for a project at India, in India China Institute called Everyday Religion and Sustainable Environments in the Himalaya. And Mark, uh, too, was uh, part of this uh, team that uh, you know, went to Kailash this past summer. And Mark is a professor of uh, religious studies at Eugene Lang College. Uh, Mark is right there. <laughs> he earned his BA in philosophy, politics, and economics for, uh, from Worcester College. And his Oxford, uh, in, uh, his, his PhD uh, in religion, religion from Princeton University. Uh, he. Uh, has published widely, uh, and uh, he has, uh, he's really a philosopher uh, who uh, is uh, also very keen on looking at the lived uh, you know, uh, aspect of religion uh, and has become very, very engaged in the Himalayas recently, and I'm really delighted to have him as a colleague. Uh, the second uh, discussant is uh, Professor Dominique Townsend. She's a postdoc fellow at Columbia University uh, and is the head of interpretation at the, at the Rubin Museum of Art. She has masters from Harvard Divinity School and PhD from Columbia's Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Her research focuses on intersections of Tibetan Buddhism and broader culture with focus on high culture, education, and aesthetics. So I'm really delighted that Dominic is also able to join us and partly represent a Rubin uh, Foundation Rubin Museum. Thank you. Uh, and our... Uh, Third panelist is Professor Siddiq Wahid. Uh, he was recently uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Islamic University of Science and Technology in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, he is uh, uh, someone that I've recently gotten to know him, but I've been hearing a lot about him from many of my mutual friends, uh, a person of many, many talents, a historian by training. Uh, he got his uh, PhD from Harvard University. Uh, but really someone who uh, you know, combines a scholarship uh, you know, in, in ways that really connects to uh, both policy questions as well as you know, uh, people looking at uh, uh, issues uh, in uh, our part of the world, that is Himalaya, uh, in, 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 from multiple different perspectives. He has uh, you know, uh, served in the uh, corporate sector. Uh, he, uh, as I said, he was part of the higher uh, education sector in India. And uh, recently, uh, I understand that he is deeply involved in uh, basically both, you know, convening uh, and uh, helping to move, uh, you know, uh, conversations around uh, conflict in Jammu Kashmir, uh, uh, you know, towards, you know, much more positive direction than uh, it has been. Uh, a, a very t tough task indeed. And in his uh, own family history is very interesting. He, you know, he really, we were laughing earlier, you know, where is he from and where am I from? You know, it, it gets very complicated. Very well connected to Lhasa, uh, uh, western part of Tibetan areas, and the whole trading, you know, uh, uh, circuit that, you know, people associate, you know, when you think about, you know, Himalayas. So I'm really delighted Siddiq is also here. So the basic format of today's talk is uh, we will now you know, request uh, David to take about 40 minutes or so, or 40, 45 minutes to 
you know, share his work. And then we will invite discussants to come to the uh, table and then share their thoughts and have David respond to their thoughts. And then at some point, hopefully, we'll have enough time to have all of you also to share your thoughts and ask questions. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ashok. And thanks to the India China Institute and the New School for inviting me and for hosting me here. And there's a lot of people to thank, uh, Chris, uh, Christina, um, others at the Institute, but also yourselves for coming out uh, this afternoon. And I hope uh, that uh, the ideas and images that we're working through over the next hour or so are, are of some interest to you. As uh, Ashok mentioned, my background is as a geographer, professionally trained geographer, and um, a self-taught photographer. So I've been making a transition over the years from my photography serving my geography to my geography now serving my photography. And um, what I'd like to do this afternoon is, in a sense, blend these two um, in this presentation. When I learned that Ashok and Mark were going to join me this afternoon, I couldn't not begin my talk uh, with this photograph. It has a certain Three Musketeers look that I just love. Uh, it was taken by Chris Radcliffe, another member of this small expedition that uh, Ashok had put together this last summer. And uh, Ashok is on the left here, Mark is in the center, and I'm on the right. Um, and behind us is Mount Kailash. We were on a pilgrimage uh, route walking around the mountain. But besides its, uh, you know, its entertainment value, there's something else that I want to mention about this photograph. We were all engaged in a joint uh, reconnaissance of the Kailash area for uh, possible academic and, and scholarly purposes. And we were also, each of us in our own way, involved in, in a pilgrimage of some sort. Um, for myself, that included uh, a final photograph that I had wanted to take for many years and, and was unable to take. Um, in past attempts to reach Kailash, either because of political problems or uh, bad weather. So this past summer, when Ashok invited me to join their group, uh, it was a great opportunity. And it allowed me to get this last picture um, and really button up what, for me, was a 10-year project. Um, and it was all leading towards this book, which I had put on hold when I realized I was going to be able to go to Kailash this summer. And I had the designer just hold a page and told him I'd be back with a picture of Kailash. And, and that kind of um, put, stalled everything <laughs> considerably. But it, the book is going to come out in June or so. I think Ashok uh, mentioned it. But let me begin, begin with this photograph here. Uh, this is a photograph taken in Ladakh above Leh, uh, Shanti Stupa, the Peace Pagoda. There's a couple of things about this photograph that uh, interests me. One, as a photographer, just the, the formal aspects of the image, the spaciousness and the geometry, the geometry and the, um, uh, the composition and the light and that type of thing. But there's something else going on here. For one, the architecture is out of place. It belongs in a tea garden in Japan. Um, it was part of, uh, it was one of many peace pagodas that have been built around the world by a, a group of uh, people operating out of a monastery in Japan. So architecturally, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the geography is, is wrong. But also, and more interesting for me, it overlooks a couple of things. It overlooks uh, an Indian army uh, barracks, and it overlooks a contested geography. Um, so there's a lot of geopolitical intrigue and tension that uh, is viewed from this plaza of the, of the uh, Shanti Stupa. As a peace pagoda, um, I thought it was a great situation for, for this kind of, of an architectural structure. At the time I took that picture, I, wasn't, I didn't have anything particular in mind. Uh, I was photographing um, places, not really connecting these places. But over time, I did start to connect them, at least in my mind, um, around this loosely uh, defined notion of a sacred geography, which is what I want to really talk about with you this afternoon. A couple of years later, on the other end of the Himalaya Range, uh, in uh, the Kham region of eastern Tibet, is a lake called Yilhun Latso. Um, where these Mani stones, these scriptural uh, carved stones, come up out of the lake. And it also was pleasing to me on, on a purely kind of aesthetic level and formally for photography purposes, it was a very uh, pleasing place. But it was also part of an attempt to 
didn't connect my background in geography with my interest in photography in a more kind of formalized way. Coming out of geography, um, I've been for many, many years involved in imagery, um, geographical imagery. And much of this uh, was geared towards uh, developing empirical cartographies, the kind of, of uh, map making that is uh, uh, rests in latitude and longitude coordinates that allows us to measure the surface of the earth, locate places, make maps, uh, measure areas, the kind of quantitative empirical studies that a lot of uh, geographers do and which I had done for much of my career. So the kind of map that you're looking at here is a map that we're all very accustomed to and it is a, a map that's based on latitude longitude coordinates and it's something that's common to us and we rely on these kinds of maps um, quite a bit. We can take this empirical information and work it through very, various softwares, really, computer-based softwares, and develop different ways of viewing that region. This, for example, is a digital elevation model of the Himalaya, which has about 20 layers of satellite imagery um, building then an image of the, of the Himalaya, which is actually accurate in terms of spatial uh, coordinates and, and relationships and everything, but obviously a very different view. And when we take a, an, uh, an image like this, uh, we're really creating this, this kind of pixelated world. And if you zoom in on this, we're really dealing with captured energy that we're organizing then uh, by, by bits, uh, pixels, picture elements uh, that we call this. So that background helps me understand a bit more, I guess, what I'm trying to do photographically in a project like Sacred Geography, where I'm dealing with not empirical maps, but mental maps. Um, these are the maps that we hold in our minds that help us navigate the world and find our place in the world. And, and you know, these maps we develop as we experience the world. Um, and these mental maps uh, have uh, various aspects to them, but it can also include this spiritual uh, dimension, this spiritual aspect. So when I'm, as a geographer, and I wear both of these hats kind of simultaneously, as a geographer trained empirically in a kind of a quasi-objective approach to science, um, trying to distance myself to a certain degree from what I'm looking at simply doesn't work in this kind of study. Um, how do you get inside a mind, <laughs> for example? Um, so in, in photography, there's a huge debate uh, having to do with, with this idea of perspective and uh, you know, who's holding the camera and to what purpose and so forth. And also, I'm interested in a landscape then that is not so empirically defined, but a landscape that is, is held in people's consciousness um, and that, in fact, becomes imprinted in a way in the landscape. So it does become tangible. And it's that tangible aspect that, that then I felt I could capture photographically. And then I could begin to see uh, you know, the landscape as a sacred map itself. This is not my idea. I mean, this has been worked through centuries by many, many people. In this particular case, you're looking at a, a landscape map uh, drawn by uh, a person in Nepal who has formal training in uh, religious paintings, tankas, but has recently moved into more figurative painting, primarily to serve a, t a, a tourism uh, market in Nepal, but in a sense capturing um, that, that kind of spiritual uh, orientation of a landscape. So if we kind of imagine how that could be seen in a place, um, then we can start to see space being organized and de demarcated in, in various ways. This is a, an archway onto a ceremonial ground um, near some mountains in Damshung County in Tibet uh, near Lake Namso, which is a sacred lake and a sacred set of mountains and actually sacred ceremonial ground. Um, so in a way, here we have a, a gateway or a threshold between profane or secular space and sacred space. And these kinds of uh, demarcations in the landscape have have markers uh, to them. So the approach that I would use as an empirical geographer based upon these kind of Cartesian coordinates which allow us to organize the Earth's surface for purposes of quantitative study or, or measurement um, have to, in a way, be replaced by other kinds of markers. Um, and really defining ritual coordinates as opposed to latitude and longitude coordinates. 
So one of the things I felt I could uh, photograph uh, legitimately, I suppose, in my own mind, were some of these ritual, um, these markers that, that mark these ritual coordinates. And they take all kinds of forms. Uh, they could be cairns, they could be prayer flags, they could be uh, sacred thresholds, uh, various things that, that sort of organize space in a, in a sense uh, according to concepts of sacred geography. In, in this way, I'm working with the idea of sacred space, which again is something that's very old and very long standing, particularly in this part of the world, and has already been represented in many ways. I mean, there's a long, long tradition of representing sacred space in, uh, um, in paintings and in artwork, uh, in terms of visuals, but also in other ways, in literature and uh, very various ways. What you're looking at here is a uh, a particular kind of a mandala, it's, it's one that centers on Mount Meru, which is a, a really a mythological mountain, a connector, uh, the axis mundi connecting the earth and the empyrean uh, symbolically that's represented in this, this particular um, tanka. And this was uh, from inside a, a, a temple uh, complex in Bhutan, the Trongsa Dzong, which is this Dzong right here. So that we have a building, which is an architectural structure built that then contains uh, these, in a way, uh, celestial markers or landscape markers. Um, and these places then become important places for people in the organization of, of sacred space. Because I was interested in uh, tangible features, photographically now, um, tangible features of what are essentially mental maps and then using you know markers in the landscape to help guide me to them what i oftentimes found um, was that these uh, took all kinds of forms and they represented um, different traditions uh, in the himalaya tibetan region the main traditions of hinduism and buddhism but also pre-buddhist bond traditions um, most notably what i want to do is organize this uh, this idea of sacred geography into some components and use some images to uh, convey some ideas about some of these components. So in one sense, we can think about uh, sacred geography as being marked by natural elements. We're, we're an earth-based uh, spiritual tradition is using natural features in the landscape. Uh, not only to mark passage through sacred geography, but to, in a sense, tap into a sense, anyway, of, of Earth energetics. Um, and these, these kinds of landscape features, then, can be quite diverse. Rivers, for example, commonly. Um, very importantly, the source of rivers, but also the confluence of rivers, the, the flow that's contained within rivers. Um, this is near the headwaters of the Ganges River. Um, and these are the Bhagarathi peaks in the background. We're getting close here to the source of the Ganges, which is one of the important pilgrimage sites for people of, of uh, Hindu um, tradition. And there are, every year, many, many pilgrims, uh, spiritual travelers, who follow this river up to the, the source of this particular river. So it could be a river like this. Um, it could be a mountain itself, a summit. This is Shivling, associated with Shiva. Um, and you know, as a, as a mountain summit, uh, in some ways representative of uh, this connector between earth and heavens, but also possibly associated with certain deities, the abode of deities, um, the abode of demons in some particular cases. But also in, in interesting kinds of ways, uh, recognizing perhaps subliminally the idea of, of uh, earth energy. Um, you know, the, the Himalaya is, a, is a, an, an active, tectonically active, seismically active place. And uh, these mountains in the Himalaya lie in the, in the main thrust zone of the Himalaya. And geographically, I've been kind of studying this stuff for, for many, many decades. But um, in this particular photography project I was involved in, in my own mind, making these kinds of connections um, between ideas of Earth and energy and the transmission of energy and the cycling of energy and then how people situate themselves within these flows of energy is very interesting. Um, 
And then at a certain point, this can be translated into ideas of spiritual energy. And then how do you, in a sense, intersect with, with these spiritual flows of energy? Um, this is in a, uh, a forest grove. Um, it's a deity statue of Kali, but it, it in a sense, uh, is capturing that notion of tapping into, into this notion of, of, a, of a divine or a spiritual energy that may be specific to a place, because it's a place where people have practiced a faith for a long time and have therefore in a sense, made it holy, sanctified it through religious practice. Um, and it may be some recognition of an of a energy that's emanating from a particular spot. So forest groves uh, may be another kind of a natural feature that would be uh, representative then of, of, of this connection between an earth-based uh, spiritual tradition and, and actual places uh, in the landscape. The idea of place itself is important in this way. Uh, the geographer Ifu Tuan came up with the term or applied the term topophilia to refer to uh, a person or society's relationship to a place, uh, a relationship that may be based upon love, uh, maybe based upon fear, um, a, a love in the sense of a divine energy, that a divine love emanating, flowing through the world, uh, a place of fear, of wrathful deities that need to be appeased, uh, recognized. And so, in a way, places then are not abstract locations um, that can be determined through latitude and longitude coordinates. Places are realized through experience. Um, and you know this is <laughs> a cover of The Economist magazine. But we are all dealing with this uh, in various ways in our own lives. And the notion of a sense of place uh, is something that we respond to at, at various levels, emotionally, physically, in terms of our subsistence and well-being, but also in terms of our self-identity and, and who we are and, and uh, how we, we move through this, through this world. So when we're in a landscape that has no seeming boundaries to it, but in fact, it, it really does. It has all sorts of places that uh, are known places within the traditions of people who reside in this, uh, this part of the world. And that allows, then, uh, a certain sense of comfort in, in knowing one's place um, in this sacred world of, of, uh, of geography and, and otherwise. In some of these places, um, People have put great uh, effort into uh, marking them uh, through architectures of all sorts, through statuary. Uh, this is uh, the Maitreya Buddha in the Tikse Monastery in Ladakh. Um, and these markers then become very, very important. In fact, they become, in, in a way, magnets. Uh, and they can also become repositories for, for deep human meaning. This is in the Alchi complex in Ladakh, which has some of the, some of the most extraordinary, exquisite in situ artwork in the world uh, within the chapels and the monasteries of Alchi. So we have here a tremendous investment of human energy and human emotion, uh, human creativity uh, in a place, which then uh, it, by virtue of that, it, in a sense, empowers that, that place and has empowered that place for a very, very long time. This is an image from uh, Drak Yerpa, another one of these kinds of places. This is, these are meditation caves, uh, not too far from Lhasa, really. Um, but they're associated with teachings. And they're associated with uh, meditation practices of saints. And it's a site uh, of pilgrimage in Tibet. And if you look closely, you'll see dollar bills, uh, not dollar bills, but rupee notes and Tibetan Chinese currency, all kinds of currency uh, pinned to the rock wall. And you also find bullet holes um, because this area was also um, part of the onslaught of religious sites throughout Tibet uh, associated with the Chinese occupation in Tibet and then later with the uh, Cultural Revolution in China. So we have a contested place here historically, but it's a very active place. So these are lived places. They're not empty places. They're not uh, monuments to some past practice. Uh, they're, they're current. They're, they're alive uh, places. But they do have a, uh, a contested history in many cases. Places such as these uh, become connected then uh, in various networks. Um, networks, for example, that may involve pilgrimage. Um, which is a physical movement of people from place to place. 
Um, this man is en route to the Ganges um, headwaters, sadhus, pilgrims, very commonly throughout this region, traveling from, from place to place, sometimes with guidebooks in hand to spiritual places, sometimes acting on memory, oral tradition, um, asking questions along the way, that type of thing. But all of them, in one way or another, following a very, very uh, long tradition of, of movement uh, among and between uh, various sacred places throughout the region. Now, in, your, in our experience, generally in the West here, and particularly in mine as a geographer, you know, we have tremendous technologies that allow us to, to become very accurate in our uh, calculation of space and, and our ability to quantify space and really move through space. I mean, we have now technologies that we're all very familiar with that we do this so that, in a sense, um, we are probably, this generation, are probably the, some of the most high-end technology users of space of any generation before us, but we, uh, we may not understand it that well, but we certainly have devices that allow us to move through it, and in some cases, um, they get in the way. Uh, every once in a while, we hear of that person who drives their car into a lake because their GPS unit said that there was a road there, even though in front of them, they see there's a lake. <laughs> and it's, it's quite amazing, but it actually happens. Um, so, you know, th these technological arrangements, on the one hand, can help us certainly uh, move through space much more accurately, because they also are very distracting. There are other ways to do this, certainly, and in this project, um, I was exploring some of these. This is the map of the Sacred Road uh, in, uh, in the Yuna northern Yunnan province in the far eastern part of the Tibet Plateau, which is a, a marker, uh, a route marker, if you will. And in this way, um, these places are connecting um, locations that are deemed uh, either auspicious due to some kind of divine energy or places that have a historical uh, importance to them. Um, in pre-Buddhist uh, Bon traditions, much of the Tibet Plateau was conceptualized as a demoness that really needed to be placated by locating temples in key places and then moving uh, amongst those various uh, religious sites. And in the process of doing that, essentially appeasing um, this, the, uh, appeasing a deity. So in these kinds of movements, obviously satellites and, and GPS units uh, won't help. So other markers are in play here. And these are the markers then that we, we can see in the landscape that help guide us. This was a, a large uh, money stone. A money stone is a scriptural rock, uh, basically, a, uh, in this case, almost a billboard on a hill above the Dzongchen Valley, um, which I could almost see it as a billboard. Uh, it was so, so profound in the landscape, almost saying, well, you've arrived. Uh, it's visible for about 20 to 30 miles down the valley, so it's, it's a very prominent feature. Um, in some cases, they could be prayer flags that are located in specific spots for particular reasons. Um, but these places, these, you, you know, on the one hand, many of you in this room may well have been in this part of the world, I suspect. And we come across these a lot, and they're very commonplace, and they can be quite beautiful and, and part of a setting and part of a scenery. Um, and all of that is fine. And they can also be understood then as, as kind of working together into a, a, a more of a, of a cohesive spatial structure that uh, would link itself to, to spiritual practice and ritual and, and systems of belief and so forth. This might be done uh, through wandering minstrels, in this case, uh, in the Funsoli Valley, where religious uh, histories and, are, are really transferred from community to community through song, for example, or through oral history or through folk folklore. There's all kinds of ways um, that this might be done through the transmission of religious teachings, certainly. So these various means of um, of connecting places help to kind of not only anchor these places in a larger sense of, of a sacred geography, but in, to, in effect create a sacred geography. It's, it's actually that circulation that, that is creating these, uh, these systems in my view. And so the, the pilgrims who are traveling these routes, regardless of intention, because they have, would have very various intentions, in fact are reaffirming the, the existence of this, uh, of this sacred uh, space.
in various ways. And then the gathering of, of pilgrims at, at key places, key monasteries, key times, festivals you know, found throughout the region are again kind of reaffirming this. And this is where a lot of the sharing that's, that's happening uh, amongst and between people, um, ideas are being transmitted, um, not only from person to person, but also from uh, generation to generation. I was, we were having a discussion earlier today with Ashok and Mark and a couple of other folks about kind of the intergenerational aspect of this whole business and whether, you know, for young people today, any of this makes sense and to what extent it does make sense, um, how it gets incorporated into their own emerging mental maps and sacred geographies. And, and you know, if, if there is anything that will speak to a sustainable future in this part of the world, it will be partly that. Um, so that kind of intergenerational transmission is vital um, in this kind of a context here. And then, you know, the notion of change itself, um, transformation, dissolution, you know, th this is all part and parcel to specifically the religious traditions of this part of the world, but to life in general. Um, so change is, is ongoing and, and it's not to be stopped. Um, so how does this notion of change get uh, incorporated into it? In some cases through, you know, an egregious history of, of bombing and, and uh, exploding monasteries and, you know, the kind of uh, associations that we relate to Tibet and the occupation of Tibet by the Chinese and the, the uh, kind of the ignorance uh, that's displayed when sacred entities, sacred places are, are wantonly um, destroyed. Um, you, you know, you go in Tibet and you, w you wander around the landscape and you see ruins everywhere and they look like they're hundreds and hundreds of years old and most of them are 50 years old or 60 years old, 70 years old at max. So. Um, you know, this can be a, a kind of an exaggerated extreme version. Um, it also happens piece by piece. Um, this is actually uh, in Kathmandu Valley, very, you know, if those of you who have been to Kathmandu, it's a densely populated modern urban setting and the Pashupatinath temple is, is one of the the most important places in the in the valley for all kinds of reasons. But above the main temple in the river are other smaller places, and many of them are deteriorating and falling apart, and uh, kind of the the woods, the forest is taking them back over. This this image, though, is kind of interesting. I took this quite a number of years ago with that thought in mind, and then this last um, summer, I was in Kathmandu, and I went back to this spot, and the whole thing was gone, and they were re rebuilding entirely a new uh, structure on the spot. So, you know, these things are these places are recycled in in a certain kind of a way. They're they're kind of recycled in the minds of people, and they're physically recycled through architecture and engineering and so forth. Um, this is an, a kind of a different way to, to think about this. This we saw an image earlier about the source of the, uh, or going up towards the source of the of the Ganges, Bhagirathi River, and this is up at the source. Uh, what you're looking at here is the Gangotri Glacier, the snout of the glacier, and that ice cave, uh, that darkened spot, um, up, uh, kind of midway up the slide on the on your left, is where the one of the tributaries of the Ganges uh, is is gushing out from, um, and it's quite a spectacular spot. Uh, if you've under, if you've ever been there, it's it's a it's, it draws a lot of people. I remember when I was up there photographing this. Um, it was an especially interesting day. The light was just perfect. The the, the you know, this is a black and white image, but it was a colorful place. It was a blue, brilliant blue sky, and the light was green and blue, and uh, inside the cave was a sadhu with kind of uh, smoky dreads where it was sitting on an iced boulder. It was just a spectacular color um, scene. But an interesting thing uh, about this is that this uh, source of the Ganges is retreating year by year, so even it isn't the same. Uh, this is a map showing the retreat of the Gangotri uh, Glacier, which was one of the fastest uh, receding glaciers in the western Himalaya. And the dates uh, that you're looking at are the dates in the end terminal moraine, the end of the glacier. Uh, to its current position and then back in time. And the, the temple, a temple that was built uh, to represent this place, the Gangotri Temple, now is, is uh, a couple of days walk away from the, the actual glacier and the actual source itself. So it's basically been retreating uphill um, for, for quite some time, but it's picking up speed. It's, it's moving backwards faster. <laughs> and geologists are studying this retreat quite, quite carefully.
Uh, in other ways, it happens uh, because things change around these places. Uh, you know, urbanization uh, proceeds and temples become engulfed. And, you know, on the one hand, this doesn't necessarily diminish their significance or importance for people at all, but it does remove them from view uh, a bit. Uh, this is uh, something that I've been thinking about quite some time because, in a way, if we're dealing with uh, a, a, a map in that are in our, in, that's in our mind that depends upon markers in the landscape, when those markers disappear, uh, we can start to lose direction. We can start to lose our sense of where we are in this world. Um, and so when these cultural markers change or disappear, there is the possibility of consequence in terms of the formation of, of these mental maps. And then the, the function and purpose of places may uh, change or there may be additional functions and purposes add on. There's an accretion that happens. Uh, this is a very important place in the Kathmandu Valley, um, a, a great stupa, Bodhna stupa. Um, and you know, if, if you look at I should have actually put a photograph from 1962 that I have in a black and white photograph where it was the most prominent feature in the valley. And now it's hard to see it anymore uh, unless you're on the third or fourth floor of the Hyatt Hotel. I think you have a great view. But, around, but on the other hand, it's still a magnet. I mean, it's, it's an enormously populated and incredibly important spot. So that it's not diminished at all in that way. But there are a lot of other ways that people also experience this particular site apart from any kind of a necessarily spiritual uh, experience of it. So in, in some ways of thinking, um, what we, this notion of space that's engaged with, I guess, an idea of sacred geography, uh, we also have to think about time, uh, especially the intergenerational notion of sacred geography. And um, what you're looking at here are two images um, about the same age, same number. Uh, one is a group of young monks in Walra Monastery in, uh, in eastern Tibet, and the other are a group of kids uh, at a monastery in Kathmandu. And uh, these kids on the right are um, hip urban young kids <laughs> in Kathmandu. But they come to this monastery in the morning <coughs> and they circumambulate this small monastery and they have a cup of tea and then they get on their motorbikes and they go to work. Um, so, you know, and I was talking to these kids and it's a very important part of their life. They're not monks, they're not devoting their entire life to religious study, but this is an important place for them. Um, and obviously the people on the, the guys on the left from the Wara Monastery, they're investing much of their life uh, in, in one of these monastery settings. This photograph is a mountain called Kawagebo, which is in the northern Yunnan province, part of uh, well, really on the eastern edge of the Tibet Plateau, but it's a part of an area that the Chinese have designated as Shangri-La. Um, and it's really a, an anchor of Shangri-La. And it's a beautiful mountain. It's a, one of the holy peaks of, of uh, Tibet, and it's a place of, of circumambulation, of pilgrimage. Um, so it's been an important place for a very, very long time. And in Shangri-La, it kind of assumes the role of Mount Karakul, which shows up in the book by James Hilton called Lost Horizon and also a film <coughs> by James Hilton called Lost Horizon. And in this book, James Hilton introduced the term Shangri-La. And uh, the Chinese have used this idea of Shangri-La to develop um, this region for tourism purposes primarily and uh, have actually, I in the initial conception of Shangri-La as a real place in China for tourism had actually employed geographers to locate natural features that most closely coincided with features that appeared in James Hilton's book. And Mount Karakul um, was one of those uh, places in the Yubeng Valley associated with Shangri-La Valley itself. So it's kind of an interesting uh, example of how at a, uh, a whole level of society and economic development one could take uh, generalized notions of sacred space, um, link those to much wider conceptions of geography, what I refer to as a geographical imagination, in this case based upon a particular piece of literature, a book called Lost Horizon, and then transform that into um, something that becomes a destination for 
um, hundreds of thousands, I think probably millions, I'm not sure, of, of tourists who are visiting every year. So it's a major, uh, major resource for, for, uh, for China. So this is what I have to say about sacred geography. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And I know that Shok has some discussants to uh, contribute to it. So thanks a lot. One thing that I forgot to mention is uh, if you want to see uh, David's uh, photographs, uh, there is an exhibit that is uh, on display on the fourth floor. If you just go down one floor and then there's a sky brace, if you walk you know, on the sky brace, they are beautiful. I forgot, I think, 12 or 13 photographs. So I would encourage you all to uh, you know, find time to uh, enjoy those uh, photographs. Uh, and that will be uh, on display until this Wednesday. Uh, so now let me invite uh, first Mark Larimore to share his thoughts. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, and then Dominic and then Siddiq. So, so I think I've already introduced all three of them, mm -hmm. so, so I'll let them go. Uh, David, thank you. Thank you so much. It was um, a joy to be taken back to these places, some of which I learned to see um, through the black and white pictures that were being taken when we were traveling together. and. Um, it's too rarely now that one sees this area in black and white in the present. I think part of the way in which we understand this area is through black and white pictures from the past and colored pictures from the present, which then somehow or other extrapolate into a future that's either in uh, fluorescent colors or perhaps no colors at all. And there's something disruptive and healing about black and white photographs from this present, I think, that both brings the past, past, pastness back to us, but also gives a more hopeful sense of the future and talks about some of those, or illustrates some of those processes that you described of transformation, dissolution, recycling. I don't really have questions. I guess I have one observation and then another observation, but I'll keep them brief because there are many people here and I'm sure many people would like to share their views. So uh, the first observation, I guess, is just on this question about transformation and dissolution and the different kinds of maps. Oh, I forgot to mention also there's something absolutely wonderful about the way in which you braided different kinds of mappings together. Um, things from the physical and natural sciences, from the social sciences, things that many of us in the humanities um, get very tense over because we don't really know how to master these sorts of images. And then other kinds in which we feel quite at home. Um, but there's a confidence in the way in which you interweave them that, again, is very um, invites people to, to make a home in this, in this landscape production, trans, um, um, <coughs> transfer tradition. Um, so I guess, I guess one observation would be that a number of these representations, a number of these mappings um, are at odds with each other. And it's not just that there is a contrast, there's a contrast between what we see now and what will have been there before, or perhaps between what people think they're seeing and what is no longer there. And we tend to mark that story through images of the devastation of a Tibetan cultural landscape represented as somehow timeless by the very specific historical event of the Chinese invasion. And I wonder if that isn't a little bit too easy, if maybe landscapes are always contested and these markers aren't just ways of reminding ourselves or projecting a shared sense of the world onto the world which we share with each other, um, but also ways of claiming landscapes away from another. And um, for those of you who are familiar with the representation of Tibet as the pinning down or the appeasing of a demoness, um, there's really no better representation of the way in which mapping is itself actually uh, a contestatory um, political intervention. And Part of what's interesting to me um, that I've learned from this project that the Luce Foundation and the India China Institute and your work among others, David, have sort of opened up to me um, is how the Himalaya manages somehow or other to accommodate a number of what might otherwise seem to be incompatible maps. And that's just an, an observation. You have, uh, the way in which you layered this sort of triggers this for me, but I think there's a, also a danger that we 
fall too quickly into the sense that there is a single shared, if deep and rich, world. The other observation, uh, more from a sort of a theoretical perspective as a scholar of religion, um, going back to the very first thing you mentioned, um, how it is that in your career you've moved from having your photography serve your geography to now being at a point in which your geography is serving your photography, um, I found that both incredibly eloquent and, um, and I found it to resonate with some of the most incisive critiques within the study of religion of ways of talking about religion that mystify something that really doesn't need to be mystified. And in particular, a critique that's been made for about 15 years now of the category of pure experience, which says that, well, the really heart of every experience is ineffable. It cannot be represented. Any representation in words, um, in images, in performances, any of those sorts of things will inevitably cheapen the experience. And that's something that's built into the rhetoric of um, a per particular conception of religion, which lets religion then be this point you can use to sort of um, map things on top of other people's realities. And the form that this critique usually takes is that, well, all we have is what's visible. All we have is what's demonstrable, what's empirical. But if we looked at it, we would realize that everything we need is there. And I think if I wanted to make that point visually, I couldn't do better than to show people um, the slides that we just saw. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you so much. That really was a pleasure. Um, you know, I too have spent a lot of time in this part of the world, and so it really is a pleasure to see such beautiful images. Um, I think one of the um, what, one sort of um, aspect of your presentation that really struck me. Um, actually, I just came from the Rubin Museum where we were looking, at, I was looking um, with some friends, friends at images of, of Buddhist um, protector deities, right? These sort of very fierce looking. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, is that better? Thank you. OK. Um, I was looking at the Rubin Museum um, at some images of what are often called protector deities or protectors, um, these very kind of fierce looking um, Buddhist images that are um, terrifying, that are often very closely associated with particular uh, aspects of the Tibetan landscape like mountains or rivers or um, and uh, the friend that I was talking to told me that a, a few years ago a Tibetan Lama in New York had uh, told him that oh you know all the protectors have left New York you know so you're on your own now basically that that, that those those um, powerful kind of forces and energies that are at play in the that are so alive in the Tibetan landscape um, or in the Himalayan landscape let's say more broadly um, are, are sort of you know given up on us um, so you know, we all we all sort of laughed and, and walked on to the other images in the museum. Um, but in in looking, especially um, in looking at the image where you talked about the sort of different um, layers of the. Um, of the, the sort of sediment right of the ground and we sort of see the Tibetan basement up to the Tibetan plateau. Um, I, I just sort of I was struck by that idea that the, the, the kind of of the earth. Um, uh, that these forces that we that Tibetans or uh, Himalayans often think of as um, the 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 spirits, right? The sort of spirit of the earth, which in in many ways is very timeless in that part of the world, right? Young people, and your comment about whether young people are sort of still connected to these ideas, I have often found that that they really are. You know, that this sort of you can be an absolutely modern, you know, can someone with very contemporary tastes and have a really kind of con, um, cosmopolitan global worldview and still really have a sense, you know. If I pee on that rock, I'm going to get a rash on my skin because the rock is it, the world around us is animated in this way that is absolutely real. Um, and so, I guess one of my main observation, again, not so much a formal question, but something I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on, is um, about the way that your your presentation made me think about sort of um, the. Um, I guess the sort of inadequacy of our um, separation sometimes between uh, you know the, the the past and the present in terms of how we relate to our geography. Um, you know, oh, I, I should have said actually that the comment in the Rubin Museum came out of someone saying, "Oh, I, there's a sinkhole in front of my house," um, and I said, and they're repairing it. You know, and I said, "Oh, that's so funny." Yesterday, I was in Brooklyn. He was talking about Harlem. I said, "In Brooklyn, I was walking along, and the block, our block, you know, near our house was cordoned off because." Um, of a sinkhole, you know, and, and the sort 
sort of sense that the, that the earth is talking back, right? That there's this sort of active um, force of the world, which we don't tend to think of as the sort of spirit of New York, um, the protectors of New York um, talking back to us about our, our choices. But, um, but in some way, your talk made me think about, um, you know, you said that maybe this is a subliminal response to the tectonic plates in these places. This is a PowerPoint. Um, but somehow, I, I think it might be interesting to bring that kind of thinking into the way we relate even to a place like New York. Um, and in, in some ways, it might not be so far off from how we, um, how we understand the world as around us already. So thanks so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, David. And I really want to begin with your first photograph uh, of Shanti Stupa. And uh, being from Ladakh, um, I always felt there was something wrong whenever I looked at the Shanti Stupa. And it never struck me that it was actually the architecture. Um, and the fact that a Japanese architecture was really out of place you know, in, in that. And so, Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I've, <laughs> I don't know how many years I've, I've gone back again and again to it. Um, I also want to uh, thank you because I, it, it brought back a memory, um, which um, was quite amazing. I, I grew up for the first few years of my life in Lhasa, as I was telling you a little bit earlier. And um, so the first time I went there as a conscious adult was many, 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 many years later. Um, and uh, I remember going uh, to Lhasa and then to the Holy of Holies uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and for the first time, I felt power, you know, with a place. Um, and felt an incredible urge to prostrate and fall down, which I didn't do. Um, and it was the more remarkable because I'm a Muslim. Um, and this was a Buddhist site. Um, and so it explains a lot of things. Um, and I think that we, we, we have, of course, lost our sense of nature. All religions, <coughs> Islam included, uh, talk about the importance of nature. And in fact, Islam refers to nature, uh, Islam, uh, refers to nature as being the first book uh, and, and the most important of books um, for, for learning. Um, and uh, we've, we've lost touch, I think. And, and the kind of thing that you're doing, I think, bringing the scientific um, along, along with uh, you know, ruminations of the mind and, and meditations, I think are very important. Um, and um, I hope it continues. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just very quickly, I'll make a couple of, I'll try to respond to all of them at once. <laughs> um, I live in a little holler in Kentucky, and I've been there for about 27 years. And we farm, and we uh, cut firewood, and we heat with a wood stove. And um, when I go to the Himalaya in Tibet, I'm a visitor. Um, and this project was a great excuse to go to some very exquisite places. And while I'm generally receptive to the notion of a, a spiritual energy, I also realize that that's not something that just comes, that that's a result of a lot of work. Uh, it may be the result of a bloodline. It may be the result of a long history. But I do know that living where I do in Kentucky, and I'm not from Kentucky either. I'm also one of these people. I'm not quite sure where I'm from. But I do know that the longer that I stay in the place where I live and the harder I work in that place on the land, the more connected I am to that place. And I think this is true for everybody. And it doesn't uh, require necessarily anybody going anywhere. And New York City is just a fine place to do that. Um, so that's one thing I would say. And the other thing I guess I would say is that as a geographer, I have been trained to see the landscape as a reflection of humanity, that it's a reflection of our intentions, conscious or, or otherwise, uh, the way that we design 
the places where we live, the transformations that take place as our lives change and as the world changes around us, these become registered in the landscape. And so the landscape is a beautiful tool uh, of, of inquiry for me. And it has been all through my career as a, as a geographer, and it is now in terms of my photography. Um, so I guess that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, we do have microphones, and I just want to make sure that people know that we are recording this uh, special uh, event. Uh, so please uh, speak you know, to the mic so that we can record it properly. Uh, properly. And also, please identify yourself. Just say who you are, so it would be um, helpful. Um, uh, <clears throat> my name is Hugh McGuire. I apologize for my voice. Um, I, I thought the presentation was really f fascinating. Uh, I, uh, I have basically two questions that I'd like to throw to you. Uh, m most Asian people that I have encountered have told me that their comprehension of, of Buddhism is cultural, whereas my comprehension of Buddhism is intellectual. And I probably have a much deeper understanding of the intellectual content of Buddhism than they do, but they have a much more profound emotional connection to the, the culture of Buddhism. So I wonder if you could speak to that, the, uh, because that relates to the second thing, and that is magic. Um, uh, I, I think many of these pilgrims um, are going on these journeys to the mouth of the Ganges or whatever um, to, to receive uh, magical benefits. Um, uh, Christians, you know, the Catholics have uh, uh, places like Lourdes and similar places where people go and they think they're going to be healed. Um, and I, I suspect there, there is that dimension um, that uh, influences uh, the, um, the attitude of people um, in, in conducting these things. And then basically the third is that um, so much of, uh, you know, the, the, the Buddha, uh, his original uh, first uh, disciples were the, the children of the nobles. Uh, and I, I think in many respects, Buddhism has continued that way through the, the centuries, that, that there's a social class distinction um, of the, the, the people who are become the, the monks in, in, in the monasteries. And, and I was wondering if, if, if you had looked into that. Thank you. David. Thank you. Um, I'm not a religious scholar, folks. Uh, I'm a geographer and a photographer. And my knowledge of Buddhism is primarily a visual one, interestingly enough, I mean, in, in the sense that um, I don't delve deeply into the uh, liturgical or scriptural uh, content of Buddhism. I have tried to learn along the way uh, a certain amount of, of core teachings. And those aren't for any other reason than that they may help me personally. I have no professional uh, claim or, or really any professional interest in kind of explaining um, anything. F frankly, actually, let me go back to why I said my, um, uh, I've switched from my photography serving my geography to my geography serving my photography because I'm less interested in explaining and more interested in evoking. Um, so that when I work visually, it's really just to give an image to someone, maybe a little bit of content or context to think about that image, but then to allow them to think about it in their own terms, according to their own knowledge. And all of us have very different knowledge bases about this subject, and so I suspect we're all reacting to them very differently. Some of them may be just reacting to it on a purely aesthetic level, and some of us may be, uh, you know, the kinds of inquiries that you have that are a little bit deeper that have to do with, with some of the meaning coming out of the experience of Buddhism or the practice of Buddhism. Um, but I, I'm really, I, I really can't answer those questions in any meaningful way, I think, that would contribute or help clarify anything. I just want to kind of put out there as transparent as I can where I'm coming from. And it's not that I'm diminishing any of that. It's just that I'm not privy to it I'm not, and I'm not familiar with it enough to even speak on it, which, you know, one could look at me as a bit of a fraud <laughs> for taking on a topic like this. But on the other hand, I really don't have any particular claim to doing what I'm doing beyond what I'm simply laying out there and, and giving it 
to people to do what they want as far as the imagery. So if the images have, have kind of sparked a couple of questions in your mind, I suspect you're going to think about those questions much more than I, I am. Uh, but thank you very much for, for raising them. And there's probably other people in the room who could help out a lot more. <laughs> OK, before we go, I think, would you like to comment, any one of you, on the question regarding you know, <coughs> the intellectual and the experiential? <coughs> It's an important question, so it please, is yeah. Question. Sure, I, if I, just to make sure I understood you, you were saying that in your, in conversation with um, people, with people who are sort of from Buddhist cultures, that their take is that, that uh, uh, your view as a kind of, say, a, a, a Western, um, someone who's curious about Buddhism, I'm sorry, I don't know your background, but if you're studying Buddhism, that it's more of an intellectual, I mean, to me, I guess. Is, their experience is oh, right. Yes, and yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that it partly, I mean, certainly in the Tibetan, um, Tibetan context, let's say, Buddhism um, is pervasive through, you know, social, more, you know, what, what, how, how to conduct yourself in a conversation, you know, what, what hand you use to hand someone something, you know, what kind of gestures are considered polite and not polite, that there's all kinds of ways of speaking, you know, that it's really pervasive, right? So that in that sense, it's cultural. Um, and, but it sounds like you're saying something kind of deeper than that in terms of the kind of emotional element or the, the, the yes, it's a kind of more integrated as to what it means is that it has less to do with the uh, uh, intellectual principles of Buddhism or Hinduism right. or, or what have you, or uh, Islam, sure. um, uh, uh, and, and much more to do with the magical dimension. Oh, I see. OK, yeah, yeah thanks. Wonderful. Right, by going to the mouth of the Ganges to uh, achieve something. OK. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So it does correct, as you said, it connects directly to your second question. Actually, my my um, uh, sort of first response to your second question is actually it's much more than magic. There is magic in pilgrimage um, in the Himalayan world, but there's also um, trade. You know, people do. Uh, sell and buy things along the way. They, um, you know, uh, uh, have other families outside of their hometown. They, you know, on pilgrimage routes, they, they, um, uh, you know, they, they study. They um, bring objects of interest from other cultures, um, and it's entertainment, right? I mean, pilgrimage is also a, has a very profound and expansive social function. Um, that that is that and. Magic is also there, but it's it's one of the elements in this, I think, very very rich kind of broad social experience of pilgrimage that in, that also incorporates learning about history and having an identity that's connected both to the geography and to the historical context of the place. Um, you know, remembering your your um, ancestors' uh, passage through those similar um, kind of locations. So I think it's magic is also there, definitely. Um, but it's to me that's one one element in this otherwise very complex and rich um, kind of ex uh, you know phenomenon of of pilgrimage, right? Um, and then in terms of the whether it's intellectual or um, or kind of something more emotional or experiential, I think you might say the same thing about about every religion, right? That most people who practice religion are not scholars of that religion. You know, they may have some some interest in the philosophy. They might not. You know, and and I'm not about to say they're not a good, you know, Catholic or Buddhist um, because they're not studying the philosophy. You know, um, so I think that might be partly what they're saying. A kind of modesty of saying, oh, you know, I don't start asking me about philosophy because that's not what I do. Um, might be part of it as well. Thank you. Yeah. Siddiq, you want to just, and then I'll. I'll I, um, the question made some, a story, a Tibetan parable, spring to mind. And that was that um, a man once set off for pilgrimage um, to India, uh, because that's where all the holy spots of Buddhism are. Um, and uh, en route, he was told by his mother that uh, you know, he should bring back a relic of some sort. So the man went and had a grand time in India, went to all the Buddhist spots. And then on the way back, uh, coming across the mountains, um, he suddenly remembered that he was supposed to bring home a relic, and he hadn't brought it. So he picked up a dog's tooth that he saw and took it back home to the village and said, this is the tooth of the Buddha. 
and they enshrined it and started to worship it and, and to pay obeisance to it and so on. And pretty soon it started to shine. You know, and stuff. So I think, I mean, therefore, just to answer the question of the material versus the intellectual, the theoretical versus the academic, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, versus the practice itself, is that the magic is in the confluence of practice and theory. Um, and in the West, we're used to the theory. And in the East, we're used to the practice. Um, I mean, with honorable exceptions, of course. Um, and so, so I think that, um, and, and in each society, the same thing happens. So I think that, that uh, the attempt in religions as a whole is the confluence of the two. That's where the magic happens. Thank you. I think I know there are many, many hands you know, going up. So what we will do is I will ask people to be brief in their you know, whatever comments or questions they're asking. And, and then we will take maybe three questions at a time. That way, you know, we'll come. And then we'll go. Two, three rounds. We have time. So please identify yourself. Toshi. Yeah. Um, I'm Toshi Tanaka. I'm a Japanese Buddhist. I'm, I work for UNDP. I work, work in Myanmar, Bhutan, also Pakistan recently. Um, there is a kind of two sp spirituality. In, in fact, uh, human being not necessary for having natural spirituality. There are a lot of nat natural power, we believe, that come from mountain, big mountain, all trees, and uh, maybe animals. And so they have its own power. So you have natural spirit spirituality and the human spirituality. And then why Buddhism, in this case, is found those locations because they love isolation, all right? They banish from the human world then go into spiritual world where no one comes, where their spirituality can f deepen itself and then where they can identify a more maybe closer to where they want to be, like in Nirvana. So in a way, um, I think you are seeing the mixtures of natural spirituality and human spirituality where I think Buddhists want to symbolize over there. So whatever they create there, it kind of create, uh, yeah, fine. Quest question, create a sh kind of synergy between the nature and, the, and what their architectures are. That's why I think it's mutually enhancing. Um, I don't have much question, but I feel very sad in Pakistan, for example, Gandhara, and all those places are becoming ruins. Then become only natural spirituality, even that kind of being lost, and human spirituality lost. Then, you know, kind of sacred geography is being affected by also disturbance of religion, disturbance of uh, again, human spirituality, um, conflict okay. in a way. So that's kind of things I, I just want to present as a kind of issues if you want to look at. Just Thank you. Two more questions. Charles here, and then, then I'll come to the second. It's to Toshi, yeah. All right. Please. Two, two questions from that end, and then I'll take the second round. Charles. Please. Hi, I, I'm Charles Zerner, and I teach environmental studies up at Sarah Lawrence. And um, I've got just a few things to say. One is simply a comment, which is I want to thank you very much for a beautifully complex, multi-layered, um, uh, contradictory presentation that brings in, um, it's like listening to tectonic plates slide under each other. <laughs> if you don't mind the geomorphological, geophysical metaphor, you've, you've really, um, you haven't woven your, you've, uh, you've described some other kind of physical process. It was great. Thank you. Here are my two comments or questions. The first one is this. Um, one of the, I may say, shocking things about your presentation was the, the revelation not only that Lost Horizons, of course, gave rise to a Chinese initiative to create a tourist site, but, but even worse than that, or, or, or felicitously, the notion that a book could then create the psychic and 
geographical grounds for creating an yet another layer of pilgrimage with Western tourists cycling in, paying for their flights, paying for their quasi-Tibetan food, and doing some form of worship. Of it's a form of globalized religiosity. Um, adds a dizzying level of complexity <laughs> to your lovely presentation of you know uh, authentic Tibet and then post-invasion Tibet. Okay, uh, that's that's the comment. Shock. The other question is, is directed more to Professor Laramore because I was somewhat disturbed um, by your analysis of uh, Professor Zurich's presentation when you said that indeed even the notion of the goddess being transposed onto the landscape of the, uh, the Nepali plateau was a form of, of a political contestation. And the question that I have for you is, is it all turtles all the way down, and but wait a moment, isn't this the kind of postmodern view from nowhere, no position, it's all just perspectival? And where does that leave us if we want places and places to put our orientation on our ground? That's, that's my challenge to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charles. One more, Anna, and then we will let them respond. Uh, hi, my name is Monica. And uh, thank you so much. I very much appreciate your approach to your work. Um, it feels really very, you're not analyzing it, you're presenting it. I very much appreciate that. Um, it evoked a lot of thoughts in me because um, um, sacred landscape, what is it? Is it just the landscape, nature itself? Does it include uh, cities, uh, people, probably all of it because we have political landscape, we have nature landscape, and probably urban landscape too. Um, I myself grew up in a tiny village of 200 people um, and where my family has lived there probably for 500 or 1,000 years and on a farm and so every hill, every field had its name, had its meaning. There were all these different spirits and um, then I lived in places like Tokyo, Mumbai, uh, New Delhi, um, Ireland, New York, um, different places and I traveled. I went on pilgrimages and I think what it evoked is isn't any landscape sacred? Um, doesn't every place on this planet have, has a meaning and spirits that inhabit it or energies that it originally has? And isn't it the religions that then use certain places for their own, I wouldn't say profit, but for their own means? They put their Mother Mary, Kali, into these places that people before religion even existed um, worshipped as a special place in nature. Uh, I know that like where I grew up there were the Romans, there were the Celts, and then the Catholics, and so I kind of grew up with all these different, uh, with witchcraft, all these different uh, things that happened uh, simultaneously actually. That's why I think it's not particular in one part of the world only. I think, uh, and then uh, just one more comment. Then I was thinking, what about urban landscape, uh, sacred urban landscape? If I meet uh, young kids, let's say 18 years old, and this kid takes me into uh, his favorite or her favorite uh, club, isn't that also their um, place where they receive energy? Isn't that also a sacred place? I think we tend to be very critical and demonize modern culture and the cities and yes, maybe originally they were built according to sacred geometry and maybe it doesn't quite fit, but doesn't um, each generation, each city, each place have its own sacredness? It doesn't have to be a mountain or a river or something else, so. Thank you, thank you. David? Well, the short answer is uh, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, in, in my opinion, and I don't, I don't think there's anything exceptional about the Himalaya or Tibet in this regard. And I think part of 
in my thinking about things like sacred geography to, to the degree that one in their own mind comprehends or not some sort of divine energy in the world, I guess is, is up to, to each of us individually. But I do believe that there are places that we go to that allow us to get outside of the normal conventions of our life that, that free our, our mind in, in certain ways. And these don't need to be the Tibet Plateau. They could well be a corner of a room or a park in New York City. So yes, I believe they're everywhere. And it really is a, a, a human consciousness that we're really talking about here in, in either in the recognition of some divine energy or in the creation of divine energy, quite frankly, by sanctifying places, by practicing a form of faith in a place. So uh, yes, I, I think you're right. And I, and I wouldn't, I would imagine they could be anywhere that we want them to be, <laughs> including here. <laughs> David, you earlier. Oh, uh, was there another question? Oh, was there another question? Yes. Uh, okay. So I think we'll wait. We'll wait. I think maybe uh, Mark. Then you oh, can. Mark. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, just a few words about turtles all the way down. That's okay. um, in some sense, well, yes. Obviously, everything is turtles. Uh, in some sense, yes. Obviously, everything is turtles all the way down. We are turtles. Um, in another way, I guess I'd say that if we didn't have access through things like David's work to the lived experience of actual people, we'd be reduced to nothing but endless escalators of turtles. And um, I mean that not in a flip way, but in a very serious way, that um, a landscape like Tibet that can be represented as the placation or the taming or the conquest of, a, of an earlier set of energies um, could be represented in a very violent way um, if we don't enter it, if we don't know what it's like. But one of the things that um, I found when I um, got to spend a little bit of time in this region is that um, things that seem contradictory at the intellectual level like these people couldn't live together with these people in this space, or these people couldn't possibly abide to this particular set of practices along with these others. When you get there, when you go there, you find that in fact there, there they are, as as the philosopher Leibniz said, the uh, the possible, uh, the actual defines the possible. So what actually happens shows you something about what's possible that you might not have been able to figure out theoretically. So there's a, an incredible contribution made by the kind of evocative work that David's. Um, ph photographs represent that, that show us possibilities that we might not actually be able otherwise theoretically to, to fathom. I, I think uh, to answer your question regarding um, isn't um, you know, all of nature sort of powerful and and, and, and I agree with that. Uh, but I think we have to be careful when, when we start talking about urban sacred spaces um, and so forth because, and I think that there is a distinction uh, between two kinds of sacred spaces. You know, for example, I mean, I can be in New York, I can be at the Empire State Building, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm in New York, you know, and that's that. Um, I can be in the Himalaya, or I can be in the Alps, um, or I can be in the Andes, or I can be in the middle of an ocean or a desert, um, and suddenly feel, by looking at a certain aspect of nature, that I'm at the center of the universe. I think that's the distinction between the two. And I think that we need to, to make that distinction, uh, or if not need. I mean, is that felt or not is a question that is very much out on the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, may I say something? I just wanted to comment also on the um, the demoness, the supine demoness that, that is Tibet, which is just such a fascinating aspect, I think, of, of um, Tibetan Buddhism and and also the violence in some ways of the history of Buddhism in Tibet that the, it is a story of domination right I mean it's a story of uh, the the earth the earth itself in Tibet is understood as this fierce wild demoness this power that needs to be pinned down and it's pinned down it's a woman also which we, we can also talk about that but it's a woman that needs to be pinned down by Buddhist <coughs> monuments and and the, this tension never goes away you know that the idea that that Tibetan space is fierce and wild, and Tibetans themselves even use words like barbaric about it, right? That the sense that it's that it's fierce and alive, and that it's it's in this ongoing, this never-ending conversation with Tantric Buddhism, that it that it's um, tamed and brought, but not just not like you know um, brought into submission and then killed, but 
but living and that this te the, the tension between the wildness and untamedness of the landscape of the earth and of the spirit of the place is in this um, fruitful tension endlessly with with Tibetan Buddhism you know and, and and it's layered with the history of domination too because the those temples really were um, or at least the mythic history is that it was a Son Son Gampo's wife, the, his Chinese wife, who brought the knowledge of geomancy to Tibet and brought the images that would then pin down that demoness, right? So we do have these wonderful layers of, of um, contestation and domination and, and then really fruitful kind of ongoing interactions, right? That I, that's one of, in some ways, like one of my favorite impressions about Tibetan Buddhism is this sense of the activity of, of the landscape. The fact that the landscape needs to be tamed is also what makes it the perfect pa place for tantric Buddhism, if you see what I mean from the Tibetan point of view, right? Thank you. The lady there, and then gentleman here, and well, this <laughs> three people. Thank you. Um, my name is Liz, and I'm deeply grateful for your images. Um, I find myself really thinking about the receding glacier and the, also the changing um, source of the Ganges. And then of the, uh, the temple that is no longer right there at the source, but several uh, <coughs> days journey away. And it, it set up for me a kind of a, a, a feeling of great loss and sadness. Um, also, I thought, well, so what is the sacred story that gets told now? You know, where, where is the earth energy now? Where is the sacred place now? Has there been a kind of a movement? Is, is all of it the sacred place? And how is that being thought about? And I, I wondered if, um, if a different story is being told because of the way that the earth is changing. Just hold on, let us take a couple okay. of questions. Yeah. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. So I don't need the mic. Uh, ah, yeah. Unless you want Yeah, I think uh, so, because we, we are recording it. Yeah. Sure. yeah, we are recording it. Yeah, yeah. So um, you do wonderful work, and it speaks for itself. Um, and uh, my question really is, about the fact that uh, you clearly went into this exercise, as you've clarified, without sort of trying to put too much of an intellectual lens on it, um, and you've succeeded. Uh, but as you were doing it, were there local people that felt that perhaps you weren't, and how did you reassure them that you, in fact, were there to celebrate this and not to deconstruct it? And in doing that, did you at times, or were you at times tempted to show them your work as demonstration of the fact that you appreciated the? Thank you. Okay, I think we'll do one more round, so I will come to you in the next. Okay. Just, just two questions, yeah, please. Just wait for the next round. Yeah. <laughs> David, please. Okay, I'm gonna, these are two great questions. I can answer them at the same time. <clears throat> and I'll answer it this way. The backstory with the Gangotri Glacier uh, and the Gangotri Temple is this. The high priest of the Gangotri Temple joined me on the walk <coughs> up to the source. And he was very interested in photography. So his was a personal hobby of his. So we were connecting on the photography end of things. But as we walked for several days together up to the source, uh, he was explaining the mountain winds as the breath of Shiva. And I was talking about adiabatic lapse rates. And we, we were talking about this and that. And there were boulders along the course of the Riverbank, where the geologists had marked the, the end moraine of the glacier in 1933 and 1957. So he was, he was asking me about this, and then I was talking about climate change and uh, recession of glaciers throughout the Himalaya. And um, then I asked him, what does this mean for Hinduism if the Gangotri Glacier disappears? And he just like looked at me and shrugged his shoulders. And this is the age, you know, of Kali. <laughs> what, what can one expect? And in, uh, it was an interesting response. We, we really didn't even pursue it beyond then. It was just this notion of, of change and transformation and dissolution, which is, which is a, a very accepting way of looking at the world. So 
you know, the questions that we might have about what does this mean for Hinduism really didn't seem to be a pressing concern. So the first question specifically, uh, that was kind of the background to, to that particular situation. But in terms of connecting with people and what they thought about it, it was an example of one, inter one interaction among many, many where I was kind of working through my, my work photographically and then also because it's tied to geography, my geographical studies, um, and exploring their place, uh, me as a visitor and them as a resident and very, being very clear about that. You know, I was a student in their place and I was kind of learning about it. And then, you know, I photograph with a large format camera. So there's no hit and run photography involved here. You're immediately the center of attention. And in fact, when you photograph with a large format camera, everything revolves around you. So it's not like you're hiding, you know? And so what, what I thought initially is that this was gonna create a barrier between myself and whatever it is I was interested in taking an image of, but in fact, it was quite the opposite. That it's an engaging process. Uh, that once you engage with, if it's an individual, for example, with a landscape that no people, it does, makes no difference, but when there's people involved, particularly if it's a portraiture kind of a thing, then once they come to an understanding of what it is that you're seeing, and this is a beautiful process, by the way, uh, and it's the most rewarding process, in fact, um, that then your colleagues in this endeavor and then you may get a good image. Without that, you're not going to get it. It's not going to happen anyway, and you might as well just pack it up and go home because it really isn't going to happen. So that's, Great. yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name is Robin Allen. I'm a visiting student here. And um, I, um, well, first I'll preface by just telling you a little bit, little bit about myself. Um, I used to work at an investment bank, and before that, I had been a um, Vaishnava. Um, which is a devotee of Vishnu. And um, one thing that I um, really thought about a lot, um, just listening to everyone talking, is um, how, like someone was saying before, every culture is inextricably rooted to its geography, topography, or some people would say geomancy. Um, and, you know, like, you know, th there's been this focus, you know, like on how holy certain spots are. Like for instance, the Himalayas is, you know, said to be the result of this crashing of one continent into the another, you know, hence the term subcontinent. But I think a lot of people forget that, you know, like um, someone was saying before about the holiness of even a place like New York. New York lies on a fault line, you know, so what does that mean? You know, is there something special about this place? Um, but kind of going forward on that um, whole idea of, um, sacred places. Um, one thing that really struck me about um, being, in being in and visiting India was the kind of mindset toward arriving at a place. You know, you'll notice that when you go to Brindavan or Tibet, you know, there are no helipads. You just can't arrive there, you know. Um, it's a lot about, you know, taking a, you know, one of those motorcycle taxi cabs and then getting to the place where you know where you're going to get on the back of a mule or a yak and then you're going to walk for a very long time. And um, I met someone, I was recently doing a um, thing down in Atlanta, um, a business thing, and I met someone named Nasi and I looked up the name and it said to separate. And then, um, and this name, it, it means priest but it means to separate. And then I was looking up the meaning of the word sacred or to sanctify, and that means to separate as well. And I was thinking, well, that's a part of the whole idea of something being holy that you can't necessarily get to it so easily. You have to walk and you have to crawl and you have to roll up 10,000 steps. And you know, all that is a part of you know, setting the mood for arriving at a sacred place. And I was wondering just, you know, like, um, I don't think no one really touched on like the politics of the area. But you know, what does it mean when you have one country or another trying to claim a place that by definition is separate from everywhere else? That's particularly what makes it special and what effect does that have, you know, not just on the land masses, but the mentality of the people who are trying to interpret, you know, what it means to live in a place? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. 
last question then I think we'll move on. Hi, I'm Kathleen and my question is more general beyond this area. Uh, as you were speaking and I really enjoyed the presentation, I got to thinking about geography and religion and religion, religion and its edifices. I mean in the Himalayas, the geography provides the cathedral and the monasteries and the markers and things are just various forms of altars within this cathedral. And you, you go in the desert and it may just be a, you know, a mud hut because geography provides, you know, kind of man's relation to the great cosmos. Uh, but you go to the flat plains of, of Europe and man created, you know, the majesty in an edifice uh, because the geography didn't provide it. And it would be interesting, you've, you've done the geography of sacred places in Hawaii, in the Himalayas, <laughs> but you know, what is the religious relationship to the geography in other parts of the world? And, and in places where uh, you have a native culture that may have had very different edifices, uh, say in South America, then when another culture moved in and, and took their European edifices and related to the geography in a completely different way. Um, it would be interesting to see other studies of other parts of the world with that same relationship. Thank you. David? And then we'll ask others also. Um, the first question is, a, it, well, they're both great questions. Uh, let me just try to answer the first one real, uh, and fairly quickly. Um, the idea of separateness, I think, is an important thing in thresholds and crossing space and moving outside the normal conventions of a person's life, provide sparking opportunities, I think, is very real. Um, and what does it mean when these places become more accessible and more convenient to get to? Does that in some way diminish the opportunities for some kind of spiritual revelation when they're turned into tourism places you can get there by road? I think that's partly maybe what you were getting at. And uh, we were talking about that just earlier today, actually, because this is something that w we're kind of grappling with conceptually in terms of the Mount Kailas region um, as it becomes integrated into the larger kind of political economy of, of China and essentially the world, um, and the infrastructures are developed to move people into that area with much greater ease. On the one hand, it makes it possible for more people to visit, uh, but does that visit result in a similar kind of response because it is so easy? I, this is a great question. I don't have any particular answer. I just want to say that it's a great question. Uh, and I think it's a very real question and a, and a very important question. And, and whether, you know, with native peoples and, and indigenous peoples and sacred places elsewhere in the world, it's everywhere. And it's interesting for me as a Caucasian person living in North America, coming out of a Christian background, where Christianity is, is a religion that essentially was introduced to this place by people who are not of this place. So what is the connection between our religious system in an institutional way and the place where we live? Other than if we personally make it one. I don't know that there is one, uh, frankly. So that's very real. And I, I think you might have almost tried to say Hawaii when you, when you started. And I have to say, Hawaii is one of my favorite places in the world. And, and it's the one place more than Tibet, more than the Himalaya, it's the one place in the world where I feel that, whatever you want to call it, spiritual energy, the strongest. And it's also the one place in the world where I feel it the strongest, where it has been so dominated and conquered by immigrant populations so that the Hawaiian people themselves have to work extremely hard to hold on to that. And it's a huge struggle within Hawaii, for sure. It's, it's, it's a major thing that's happening within Hawaii amongst indigenous Hawaiians anyway. So, yeah. Thank you. Would you like to make any last minute comments? No, thank you. Well, I just want to thank David for a truly beautiful, profound, and thought provoking, you know, really, uh, you know, presentation. So, and thank you also to all the discussants for really adding to the conversation. And thank you all for raising questions. <laughs>